Um, we're going to move along to our second speaker this morning, who's uh, very familiar to many of you in the room, I realize has been, again, a, 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 a huge support for the CLL community and for this meeting in particular, and that's uh, Dr. Susan LeClaire. Um, she is the uh, Chancellor Professor at um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to screw this up because I'll I'll, I'll pick the wrong Dartmouth, but um, at, at at the University of Massachusetts uh, Massachusetts Dar uh, Dartmouth. So so Dr. Leclerc is um, involved in lab medicine. She's an expert in interpreting all of the uh, lab and uh, specialized testing that goes on in uh, patients, in particular with CLL. And I would say her particular uh, gift and contribution the CLL community has been that ability to take very complicated uh, tests and results and explain them uh, to patients and through online resources and, and publications and, and, and support uh, has been, I think, extremely uh, valuable in, in, in trying to uh, help patients understand uh, some of the complicated nuances of their, of their investigations and testing. So it's a pleasure to have her back and speak about prognostic marker testing. I too am amazed that you're all awake this morning. Um, but then again, I've tried to lecture to non-science majors before, so I should be used to occasional blurriness. Um, I, I, I made a last minute change, don't, don't worry, the, the PowerPoint's gonna stay the same, but since it is hard to, to not see and point at the same time, um, I, I'm gonna ask you all to play a little macrame game with me as we go along, because I'm gonna use your um, name badge, hmm, your name badge um, as um, a, a little bit of a extra audiovisual aid. Now, I also have to apologize in the very beginning. Um, I doubt sincerely I'm gonna get to the end of my slides. My, husband tells me that I can do 45 minutes on hello. So there's a possibility we may not get to the end. Um, sorry, I'm going to try. Um, Wayne, I'm going to ask you to be exceptionally tolerant. Uh, we, we heard an awful lot of technical stuff yesterday. And, and I thought when, when they asked me to do this prognostic testing thing, that since I am not, those of you of an age, um, I am not Karnak, and I do not believe that I can do prognostics. Um, I will leave that up to the economics people uh, to figure out what's going on in advance, that what I would really do is spend the time shoring up holes in your genetics basics, and then go on to talk about some of the testing that's done so that um, some of you are gonna be bored some of the time, Wayne's gonna be bored all of the time. Um, <laughs> others of you might at least be able to get out of this something on a, oh, that's what they meant. So we're gonna start, um, and, and while I have decided to refrain from going all the way back to Imhotep to explain historical stuff, we are gonna start in the 1940s uh, for a little bit of this. And, and, and why do I want to start in the 1940s? Because it was somewhere around the 1940s that um, people started looking at material that was inside the cells to see what the units of heredity were. So at the moment, take off your name tags, and I want you to twist them, and then I want you to double them and, and twist them, and then I'm going to try not to hit the microphone again and try doubling it, and then just hold on to it. See, you notice I'm not damaging the name tag. You can still keep it as a souvenir for your, for your mirror at home. Okay, you just became a cell, and your fist just became the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is your um, units of heredity, the thing that makes you you. So that's your DNA. It's not entirely your DNA, and I will explain this to the science god later. But with broad strokes, this is your nucleus, and right now we only have a little bit of, of DNA. Bacteria and fungi are in here only because my husband is a microbiologist and I can't get out of the house without mentioning them. But basically that's what we're gonna talk about is the nucleus and the DNA that's inside it. The DNA inside the nucleus really comes in essentially 
two major structures. The one that's in your hand right now, super coiled, nice and tight, kind of difficult to look at inside the nucleus. And then there's the type of, of DNA that you see during, I think it might have been your fourth grade science class, during mitosis. Is this bringing back Mrs. Worley and the homework that you might have done? Okay, so during, mito during mitosis, the cell then takes this scrunched up material that you've got inside your nucleus and makes chromosomes out of it. Makes these long stringy um, X's, the, the bottom, the bottom um, graphic there is a karyotype. It is taking someone's DNA either causing the cells to undergo mitosis or allowing them to do it by themselves, and then literally, with paper doll scissors, taking a picture of all of these chromosomes, cutting them out, and mating them by size and by structure. So you have now a stretched out chromosome. It's got different pieces in it, but you can't see what they are because it's still rather overcoiled. You've got long ones, you've got short ones. Some of you in the room have mismatched the ones, but that's the XY chromosomes and we'll talk about them later. Um, the middle of the chromosome um, is poorly named. The, the upper part of this X chromosome is called the P chromosome. And for those of you who speak French fluently, one of the easier ways to remember the P is upper is petite, because it's always the smaller of the two sizes. The bottom is Q. The middle, which may not be in the middle at all, is called the centromere, but it's where the two strands cross. So when you hear people talk about, well, you have, um, I'm going to pick different, different um, chromosomes. When you have chromosome 1P deletions, it means that something's wrong with the upper le level, the upper arm of chromosome number 1. If they say, oh no, you have chromosome 9 addition, um, and it's in the Q region, that means that there's more chro chromosomal material down at the bottom than should be at the top. Does that make sense for those of you who aren't already bored? Okay, so this is how you count a karyotype. You can um, treat it with enzymes and make lighter and darker banding in here. So again, when you hear people say, oh, well, this person has got chromosome 2P and it's a deletion of 2.1, they mean a location that they have identified because chromosomes will make some areas lighter and some areas darker. So the banding that they're talking about allows for location pointing. Oh, well, your problem is in the upper arm and it's at 1.7. Okay, that tells them where things are. Does it tell them oh, what it is? No. Chromosomal karyotyping can only do so much. It, it has a limit to its sensitivity. It can tell you big pieces. It can't tell you individual things. So can I, can I, can I identify sickle cell, which is a very, very small mutation? Not with a karyotype. No, I can't. Can I identify Down syndrome? which has three instead of two copies of a particular chromosome, yes, I can. Can I identify um, the loss of maybe 100 pieces of the chromosome? Possibly not. I can do 100,000. I mean, I can do the big stuff. But karyotypes will only give you a general indicator of where things might be, or how things are important. And even though it's not CLL, I think it's the one that we all have to deal with um, when we talk about this stuff, is that, all right, this was in the late 1940s that we figured out how many chromosomes humans are supposed to have. And it was in the 1960s that somebody looking at karyotypes said, gee golly whiz, 
Everybody who has chronic myelogenous leukemia has this one specific piece of damage that occurs and that I can see using a karyotype. So CML became the first and for a long time the only malignant disorder that had a recognizable mutation. Now that's changed, but remember the, the, the times now. 1960, 63, we finally figured this one out. Okay. If you unravel your chromosome a bit, you will notice that there are areas of light and dark in there. And I'm gonna call those your genes. I'm gonna say that in this mix, you have areas that you see, if yours isn't upside down like mine, you might actually be able to read the words. If you have your glasses on, unlike me, you could read the words. <clears throat> but this, this twirling around is done chemically um, by the inside of the structure, there are four base pairs that people use um, when, they, when they double up their chromosomes. One base pair is adenine, and it always, always, always should bond with thymine, and, cy and cytosine, which almost always, always, always should bond with guanine. Why do I say that? Because that's how mutations can occur is that instead of binding together the way they should, perhaps they make a mistake. Now this is going on in trillions of your cells every day. Uh, for those of you who are, who are cellularly minded, um, look inside yourself for the moment and see some of your cells untwisting this stuff and opening it up and making new stuff and binding it back together again and Really? It should be 100% perfect all the time? That's kind of a, a hard burden for a cell to deal with. They'll do the best they can. Um, in school, everybody wants to get 100, but really, a 90 is an A, and let's be reasonable about that. So, you know, a lot of times there might be mistakes that occur in here. Some of them might mean nothing. Some of them are going to be repaired. Most of them, hopefully, will be repaired. But you can see by the untwisting and then the rearranging, and then you've got to build new stuff, and then you've got to build it back again, and then you've got to retwist it up. There are a number of situations in here in which mistakes can happen. Okay, this is a picture of the, of, uh, of the banding, just to give you a sense of um, as with yours right now, there are, there are periods of vital air, and then there are periods of dark blue. So this banding can occur. It makes it easier to see things. When you uncoil a chromosome, you uncoil both sides. You want to do that because you want to make another copy. And to make another copy using DNA, you make one copy of this side and one copy of this side. So what you're getting is a twofer. I'm going to get two hopefully identical products by banding all of the A's to all of the T's and binding all of the C's to all of the G's. I should be able to make a perfect copy of this. When do I do this? I do this during mitosis. When does mitosis occur? It depends on the cell. There are some cells where um, mitosis will occur every hour. In some bacteria, um, my, uh, this kind of mitotic division might occur every nine minutes. So it'll vary by genus, it'll vary within you. Your central nervous system cells don't like to do this. They are about the prissiest, um, aggravating cells you've got. They don't like changes in temperature, they don't like changes in glucose, they don't like, change, they don't like changes at all. On the other hand, your skin cells are pretty, well, tolerant to that. And, and for those of you who, who might have been here last night a little late, or were in the room next to me last night, or a little later, um, 
The most forgiving cells you own, you should be very grateful to them, are your liver cells. Um, they tend not to undergo mitosis, but they do tend to forgive you a lot. So, you know, there, there are different types of cells that you've got, some more forgiving than others, some more active than others. You know, when, when yesterday people were talking about, well, you know, your granulocytes only last for seven to 10 days. That says something about the rate of mitotic division that they have to have in order to be able to live for seven days, die off, they're my favorite cell, um, and, and then be replaced so that the number of cells that you've got is continuous, as opposed to, I think it was Dr. Keating who said something about uh, B cells and CLL might last months or perhaps even years. Well, then they have a much slower mitotic rate. And if that's the case, Doing karyotypes on a slow mitotically rated cell probably isn't the best thing to do because it's hard to do because you have to convince them to do something they don't want to do, which is to undergo mitotic division. Okay, the technical term for looking like a tuning fork is a replicating fork, and that's how you duplicate things. Okay. This is where we cheated in the 1990s. We're moving along, you see. Somewhere in the 1980s, just as an aside, um, they actually figured out what the problem was with CML. So that they could then correlate, this is the disease, this is the karyotype, this is the product of that problem in that karyotype. So we got that somewhere in the 1980s. Um, in the 1990s, Politics got into medicine. It never does that. But in this one particular instance, um, politics came into this, and politicians decided that they wanted to identify the entire human genome by 2000. Well, they actually cheated. What a shock. Uh, there, there are genes that we know that make proteins. When everybody was talking yesterday about tyrosine kinases, and making the correct tyrosine kinases. They were talking about a group of genes called exons, and, and so um, make that, make that um, the vital air. They're exons. They make things, they are expressed. Well, what about the blue stuff? The blue stuff is called introns because it's not expressed. Now, how do we, decide how to do a human genome project. Well, we have to identify what every gene does. Oh, wait, there's a whole bunch that aren't expressed. Hmm, why don't we declare the project finished when we get done with the exons? Oops, a little detail. You know, because, I mean, they're the only ones that count, right? Um, even though now we kind of figured out maybe introns are a little more important than that, um, and that maybe they're regulators of things that you know, uh, well, at any rate, in case you ever want to know, and it's always nice to have something, physicians don't listen, it's, it's always nice to have something that scares a physician, you know, creates the opening of a conversation. So if you want to, um, you, can, you can use the AUG thing and saying, well, you know, are any of my drugs modifying my AUG start codons? That ought to change the environment in the room just a, a little. Okay. That's, again, a replicating fork. And, uh, so what happens during replicating forks? This is probably where evolution occurs. And, and evolution can be good. You know, we went from walking on all fours to, well, nowadays walking on two and a half, maybe three legs, depending on whether or not you've got your cane. Um, but, but it caused us to change something about us, and that's a good thing. Um, can, can this change be bad? Uh, well, yeah. Um, one change created sickle cell anemia, which is kind of a potent kind of change. So, so the changes in these mutations may not be a bad thing, may be an irrelevant thing, or may be a good thing. Um, so it's hard to automatically say, oh, well, this is a mutation, therefore it must be bad, because you have mutations. Um, those of you who are IVGH, you want a mutation because that's a good thing. Okay, what do these genes, the exons in particular, what do they do? Well, um, some of them make proteins, like the tyrosine kinase. 
Some of them regulate the amount and the timing of proteins. Some of them are suppressors or repair genes. Any one of those can be damaged at any time. If you look at CML, it makes a, what a shock to this audience, a bad tyrosine kinase. Do you get the feeling that they're not really the nicest enzymes you've ever had? Um, and, and we knew that in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, late 1990s, the very first medication came out to attack the abnormal tyrosine kinase that was learned about in the 1980s that was first uh, located on the chromosome that had the abnormality in the 1960s um, that was first discovered as a karyotype sort of thing in the 1940s. And, and what I want you to see is the time limit here. The 1940s to the 1990s. It was 50 years between um, a description, a thought, a connection, an understanding, and a medication. And I want you to think about that one often because when you think about what you heard yesterday and the times that we're talking about, and, and um, Nicole's slide at one point where she showed you what had happened in the last year and a half, two years, things are going for CLL, things are changing for CLL that are, that are um, immense both in their, in their quality and in their speed. So there's a huge amount of work going on. So acknowledgement about prognostication number one, it's too fast for anybody to judge right now. It, it really is. There's so many uh, researchers out there looking for various things. There are so many drugs in clinical trial. There are so many more things than um, chlorambucil and, and prednisone, and, and think of the timeline. That was something that you were using in the 1980s, 1990s, and look what you've got now in comparison to CML, which started in the 1940s-ish, um, and didn't get to be, have an effective treatment until approximately the year 2000. So this is, this is an astonishing uh, level of speed, and those of you who came out of here yesterday saying, I need a drink, because I don't understand it, as opposed to I need a drink to celebrate it, or I just need a drink. Um, th th this is this, you should be confused. Welcome to the club. The guys in the front are confused too. Because this is happening so fast that it's, that it's hard to keep up with what's going on. Okay, um, what about regulating the amount and timing of, of proteins? There are, there are genes that we call operons because they operate. Um, one thing you'll notice about science, we are highly unimaginative when it comes to names, uh, which sometimes causes problems. But here's a, a really good example of what I mean by operonic activity, items that turn on and turn off. Uh, this happens to be uh, the way hemoglobins change over age. When you were not so long ago in your first trimester of gestation, you didn't have the same hemoglobin that you've got now. You had something that had epsilon chains in it. And the epsilon chains came up and out of nowhere and they built you a hemoglobin and then after a little bit of time, that went away and another hemoglobin chain called gamma chain came in unimaginatively forming a hemoglobin known as fetal hemoglobin because, well, that's what you've got when you are. Um, and then after birth, that fetal hemoglobin kind of trundles its way down and adult hemoglobin, beta chains, starts building up. So you have a, a nice little example of things that can turn on and turn off. So one possible problem with mutations are things turn on, but they don't turn off. Or things don't turn on. Um, and there are tons of examples where these kinds of things happen. You turn on a gene to make growth hormone when you're seven and you become an NBA basketball player at seven feet two inches. You don't turn growth hormone on. You not only don't become an NBA basketball player, 
you maybe are considered vertically challenged. Um, I feel that way every now and then. My husband's six two. Uh, it's a problem for me. Um, and and so, so height changes. Uh, those of you who might have uh, people that you know who have got diabetes, there's a type of diabetes in which the, the insulin cap making capacity of the cell is damaged at the genome level. So they don't make enough of it when they're supposed to. So on and off happens all the time. Some of us change color through the years. Um, some of us lose things um, over the years. Um, and that too is part of this on and offness of these genes. Damage an operon, you don't damage the quality of the protein that's being made. It's either not made, not made enough, or made too much of it. What can you do with these genes? Well, you can undergo mitotic division and make another one. That's sometimes good, sometimes not. Um, you scratch your hand on something, you open up uh, an abrasion here, you expect those cells to undergo mitotic division and reseal and heal. On the other hand, you nasty people, you want your white cells, particularly the granulocytes, to grow up, become effective, <laughs> and die because they're fighting off the bacteria that you um, inadvertently introduced to your bloodstream this morning when you took your, your toothbrush and rammed it right against your hard palate. Oh, you missed. You know, and, and so you expect your white cells to just go out there, your granulocytes to go out there and eat up all of that bacteria and die for you. So yes, you can make a cell, you can cause a cell to program itself to die for you. If it's going to die, you want it to die at an appropriate time. Don't let it suffer. You know, just let, let it die quickly. Um, and, and so you don't want it to be damaged and floating around. We see that a lot. When you look at your, um, when you look at your CBCs, under the granulocytes, you may see some comments. Um, granulocytes have got vacuoles granulocytes that have got unusual granules, granulocytes that have got something called Durley bodies if you're German and Dolly bodies if you're not, because um, some of us don't believe in umlauts. And, and those are all indicators that your cells have been under stress and are trying to do things for you and are exhibiting the change that stress can sometimes give them before they die. Okay, what are some of the outcomes of some of these genetic problems? you don't make enough cells because they don't undergo mitotic division. And so what happens to you is instead of having um, a thousand cells, you only have a hundred. Or in the case of red cells, instead of having trillions and trillions of cells, you only have trillions of, of cells. But that's called anemia. It's one of the major types of anemia is the inability to make enough cells. Why would anyone do that to a bone marrow? Because many of the chemotherapeutic drugs, the traditional cytoreductive drugs that people use, were aimed at preventing cells to undergo mitosis. Why did they want to do that? They wanted to do that because it's a good way to kill cells. If I prevent you from undergoing mitosis, you don't grow in number, you don't grow in, then in function because you're not there, and you can create a pretty good kill zone around them. So you have something called an aplastic anemia or a hypoplastic anemia. It's very common in people who have classically described cytoreductive drugs. Everything goes down. You know, it's just one of those teensy-weensy side effects that we kind of tell you about, but not entirely. Okay, um, what else can you do to the, with these mutations? You can cause these cells to undergo mitosis, but not work. Well, how do you do that? Um, you can just force them not to do something. But for you today, I think one of the bigger issues with the changes that, that mutations can give you is um, you have a repair mechanism. 
in your cells. It's a fairly complex one, so I'm only gonna talk about one of the items. But one of the items that occurs in your cell as it looks at and does quality control on your genes here is if it sees one that's abnormal, it can fix it. It can repair itself on its own. Or it can suppress the cell that's got the damage and, and somehow control the cell to the point where the cell dies rather than continue to live and proliferate. P53 is an example of a, of a suppressive process. If you damage P53, then the cell that's damaged is allowed to continue. Does that make sense so far? Wayne, am I okay? He's he, the one that makes me nervous. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that you see in CLL. If everybody got a sense now of the, of the lay of the land in the, in the genes, in the chromosomes, in the nucleus, in the cell, let's talk about some of these. And the first one um, that, that, that I actually want to read from the opposite, not left to right, but right to left in this, is we first found out there was a problem in chromosome 17. How did we do that? The karyotype told us that there was something missing or something altered. So then you take some P, um, cells that have got this abnormal chromosome and you say, you look at it and you say, okay, in this particular, in this particular um, chromosome, which I can't open, so we'll just use it there. I have this area, and I know the chemical structure of this. So now I'm going to take from the start codon to the stop codon here, and I'm going to see what it makes, and I'm going to see what it does. And, and I can, oh, yours is different. Okay, here. And, and so I'll have a sense of what might be going on. And if I, can if I can identify this structure, then I can make what's called a probe. It's the mirror image of this structure. And I can then take some of your cells, mix them with this mirror imaged probe, and encourage this mirror image probe to mate with the chromosome piece that it, that it fits most comfortably with. If I attach a fluorescent dye to that probe, then I can take your cells, spread them out on a slide, shove them under a fluorescent microscope, and I can see areas of fluorescence. Well, where is that fluorescence? The fluorescence is bonded to vital air. I don't think they thought I was going to have this much of an ad for them. They're bonded to vital air, which means you have at least one copy. Oh, look, maybe you have two copies, and I get two spots of fluorescence. Or maybe I have three copies, and I get three spots of fluorescence. When people talk about fluorescent in situ hybridization, fish, the technique that they're looking at well, it's not quite vital air, but it's close enough. I might, I'm trying to see, I have a probe. I know what the probe does or doesn't do. And I want to see how many of the pieces of your chromosome can be bonded to this particular probe. And I can count the number of them that you have. Do you have maybe three copies? Do you have no copies? Do you have some copies but not enough copies? Do you have a copy that doesn't bind as well as it should? I, I can figure this out. And so far, we know that there are four major areas of vital air that seem to be tied in to CLL. Some of them are good things to have, some of them are bad things to have, but we know they're tied in somehow with the progression of, of CLL. Um, and, and I have to kind of step back here. 
um, human investigation of DNA was not the first time we tried to understand what a genome was. So consequently, some of the names and some of the titles come from previous work in other facilities on other species. So for example, Notch 1 was actually first found in a fruit fly. And um, to talk about the evolution of life, I guess, Notch 1 in a fruit fly, this is going to be a toughie, notches the fruit fly's wings. It doesn't do that to you. You haven't had those for a while. Um, but what it does in your system is provide um, an unwelcome resilience that you don't necessarily want. So you have that. You notice the chromosome. I keep wanting to point. Notice the chromosomes here. They should look somewhat familiar. There are people walking around here who you know, shook my hand and said, hi, I'm 17P deleted. I think really your name was Fred, but um, yes, seven, see the chromosomes, 17, 11, 9. These are common chromosomes that people talk about. Why don't we talk about all of them? Because some of the damage is so small that in the karyotype we can't really see it. So it's easier to just talk about the mutation itself than to tell you, oh, well, you know, you have this, this minuscule, non-visible mutation on a chromosome. So you just talk about the, the actual mutation itself. As of about six months ago, there were at least five more of these mutations that we know people with CLL have got. We're not entirely sure what they do. Um, and first, we have to find out what they have to do normally, and then we have to figure out what they do in people with CLL. So um, will you hear more about these? Yes. Is there a problem with their nomenclature? Because it actually makes no sense. Um, the biggest problem is that because other people were working on other genera, um, they were working on other diseases, there are some initials that mean two different things. So if I'm in a room with a bunch of people who've got CML and I talk about BCR, they think I mean breakpoint cluster region. Uh, but you don't. You've never heard that before. You think of it as B cell receptor. So when I, this is a private plea, um, when I say on some of the lists, could you spell that out for me? Um, it's mostly because you're using an abbreviation that might have been used in two or three other diseases, meaning two or three other things. So abbreviations are cool. They make you sound very jargony when, when you talk about somebody having a, um, a BIRCH3 mutation, but, but it would be helpful if it were more completely discussed. Okay, some of your big mutations that you talk about, and this is an example of one that you want is your immunoglobulin variable heavy chain region. One of the things that lymphocytes do, that by the way, granulocytes do not, is they will take a piece, a piece of your genome here, and they will, great, and they will rearrange it. It used to be this, and now they've rearranged it to be this. Why do I care? Um, chromosomally speaking, I can't see this. It's the same length. All they did was just rearrange it. What has happened, though, if you think back to that operonic activity, is that maybe this cell couldn't do something. In this instance, respond with variable heavy chains. And it grew up to the point where it learned how to drive. Now, there was a difference in you the day before you got your license and the day after? Maybe nobody else could see it, but you could feel it. Well, in this instance, you have a, you have a cell that um, knows it's supposed to respond with the immunoglobulins as kind of sort of-ish, um, figuring out how to make them, and that does that little rearrangement of its genes, which allows that gene now to make heavy chains a variable kind of, of heavy chain, um, an adult kind of heavy chain. And so that's a mutation 
like an operon, that turns on in the development of the B cell, and it means that it's older. Guys, you got your license, you became more suave, no? Um, the shoulder went back a bit, um, the arm went with a little more um, security around your girl's shoulder just because you got your license. Well, the same thing is true kind of with cells. Yes, I think of them as people. Um, that that when, you, when you move a gene like that, it goes from, I don't think I can do this, to, yes, I can. It means it's older. It means it's more aware. It means it's a little more functional than it was the day before. So you want this mutation. This is a good thing in your cells because what does it say about your CLL cells? They're a little older, they're a little wiser, um, they're a little more amenable to standing in line and waiting, um, to being affected by their environment. If I put you all in a queue, while you'd all grumble, you'd all wait to get out of the door. If I said to a bunch of five-year-olds, okay, everybody stand in line and be quiet till you go out of the door, that's not gonna happen. So um, IVGH mutation lends itself to a more um, suitable for treatment, more obedient, more responsive to treatment kind of cell. It also tells us that you have, if not two different kinds of cell populations here, you certainly have two different age populations here. You've got, you've got um, one cell that will understand the environment and try and work with it, and one cell that's maybe oblivious to it. Well, what's gonna happen if I give somebody medication? I'm gonna get two different responses to that. No, um, I may get more side effects from the one that is uncontrolled from the one that's a little more self-disciplined. ZAP70, very closely related to IGVH, um, is a genome that's, that's located on the long arm of two. So again, if you wanna do something to engage your, your physician in a polite discussion, you can ask them if you have any damage on, on chromosome two, and, and that should kind of get you down a, a road of conversation as well. This, this protein, it doesn't matter that it's on chromosome two. What matters about this is that this is a protein that should be on stimulating cells. Um, T cells in a typical B cell situation um, or NK cells in a typical situation our controllers, the T cell is the one that tells you, you may now begin your immune response, you may now stop your immune response. T cells are involved um, in, in that level of discussion with B cells. Well, B cells shouldn't have ZAP70, B cells should just do their own thing um, in their own manner. So when you have an abnormal gene that's active in the wrong cell, you're going to have some kind of difficulties with this. Let's see. Um, CD38, you will hear frequently. Why is CD38, and this I think it will be the last one, why is CD38 so important? CD38, much like um, beta-2 microglobulin, are found on cells that are active. Both of these um, reflect the cell's ability to move Limbs aren't supposed to move that fast. But this is a cell that's gonna be able to move. It's going to, yesterday, it's gonna work in those micro niches and it will become more active if it's got a lot of CD38. It'll become more active if it's got um, a lot of beta-2 microglobulin. So when you have an increase of those in your system, it means you have more active cells than cells that are interested in siestas and cells that are more somnolent, more, more slow driving, more slow working. Yes, I know, I'm gonna be good. Okay, so moving along. Um, I've been told that these things are gonna be somewhere available to you. So, so you can learn about the suppressor genes in AT. It didn't like doing that? Okay. Um, any rate, he, he's telling me I have to go. Um, 
and damn, my husband is right. I didn't get to the end. Um, I didn't think husbands were supposed to be right all the time. So, any questions? Or do you just want me to leave? Uh, I definitely do not want you to leave. Um, it, it, it is, uh, um, we are running a, a little bit behind though. And I do sincerely, sincerely apologize for that. The talk was excellent. Um, the, to the talk really was excellent, and um, I, you know, I, uh, uh, having spoken to, to, to several in the audience um, uh, uh, y yesterday, even though the, the quality of the talks was extremely high, it is at times quite difficult to understand some of these nuances, and you know, sessions like this are really important to the group. And, um, and they're complicated, they take time, and thanks for taking the time, and I apologize for booting you off the stage. <laughs> <laughs>